that magic? What did I just do? All right, now comes this so that I can make sure I don't just go on and on. <sighs> Thank you so much for braving this cold, <laughs> cold morning. I was shocked to find that it was about, I found out the temperature is about the same in Albuquerque as it was up here, which was, I guess, lucky, because usually it's a lot colder up here. In the month of December, we are talking about living as wholeness in the themes of the Center for Spiritual Living. And this week, the title of my talk is Recognizing Wholeness, Seeing My Connection to All. So living as wholeness, not seeing wholeness, not recognizing, not knowing that there is a wholeness that exists somewhere out there because I read it somewhere, but indeed living as wholeness, living, and we can fake it till we make it because you can live as if you know and, and believe and embody, like as if all of that is within your conscious awareness. We can do that. And then we can grow into that. So I just want to be clear that in order to go through with what we're talking about today does not mean that you already have to have within your consciousness a really solid awareness and are already living as wholeness. This is a journey, a journey that we are walking together. So I'm going to start off with a quote. When we recognize our common humanity, when we recognize our own humanity in the face of the other, we also recognize the face of God. That is from the book Grounded, Finding God in the World by Diana Butler Bass. And that too sets the tone for what I'm talking about today. When I was a little girl, I was probably between like 10, 9, 10, 12 years old. My mom and I, we live, I grew up on a farm, and so we'd have to drive into the little, the closest little town to pick up things at the grocery store. And we were driving and we came to, I'm, I'm just picturing the whole thing as I'm talking to you about it, came over the railroad tracks that were right before the stop sign, came over the railroad track and we were stopped at the red light. And catty corner to us was a bar. Now, little girl, I didn't know what the heck, you know, really, but it didn't look like a very nice place. And out stepped a man. And there was something wrong, something clearly wrong. He seemed to be, I didn't understand at the time, but he seemed to be having some kind of an episode, a seizure, or something like that. And instantly, I was just like, oh my gosh, what's happening? We have to go help him. What can we do? Like, we're on this street. There's nobody else on the street. There's no one else on the other side. Nobody's crossing. It's just me and my mom in the car, and this guy, catty corner to us, at the bar. And I'm like, mom, mom, do you see him? We have to go help him. And she said, no held me back as if we had been in a car accident. No. I mean, she could tell how urgent my experience was. Mom, we have to go help him. No, we are not going to do that. You will, you know, pulled out that mom voice, like the one that you will not cross. You will not get out of this car. We are not going over there. We don't know who he is. We don't know what's happening. This isn't safe. That's not safe. You can't go over there. I, we don't, I don't know what to do. What would I do? And to me, as this little girl, I thought, it does, what difference is Like, we just need to help that guy. That experience has stayed with me so profoundly throughout my entire life. It breaks my heart whenever I think of it. Because there was something in me, in me, that needed to cross the street, run across the, I mean, I wouldn't have, I mean, it was probably smart of my mom in some ways, because I would have just run across the street, not looking for the traffic that was crossing. But I so wanted to go over there and help him, and, and, and I didn't know what to do, but I needed to go. And what I learned from that experience was a deep need to protect myself. Protect myself from being uncomfortable in unknown situations. Protect myself from not knowing what to do, being in a situation where I don't know what to do. 
And, you know, pretty much everything is potentially dangerous. Right? Stranger danger. If it involves someone that I don't know, there is real potential danger there. When it broke my heart. And because it broke my heart so profoundly, the solution that I came up with, because I, it wasn't working for me to look into the pain and suffering of other people and not go, not, not move, but I was taught how dangerous that was. And so I just stopped looking. I just stopped looking. I don't look into the eyes of the people that are asking for money when I come up to the stoplight. And I have to change the channel immediately when those ASPCA commercials come on. Immediately. I can't I hear the little, in the arms, look, change the channel. I don't get to the angel part at all. Like I, I learned so thoroughly to protect myself by not stepping in and doing something, and then also protect myself from the discomfort and the pain of not stepping, that I stop looking. What we are talking about in living wholeness, and specifically today about recognizing our oneness, like recognizing our oneness is central to science of mind philosophy, yes? Like we talk about it a wholeness, oneness, connection, we talk about that. A lot, it is central to this experience and beyond our experience of duality, right? The experience that we have on this planet, the gift and the challenge that we have on this planet is that we believe that we are separate from one another. It looks like there's a chair there and I am here. It looks like you are over there and I am over here. It looks like the ceiling and the lights are over there and I am over here. There is duality. But beyond that experience, beyond that, actually unbroken wholeness, unbroken wholeness, always, no matter what we think, no matter what we experience, no matter what we believe, that does not impact the wholeness that exists, that is indeed unbroken. And the hints that we get to that truth is that we are interconnected and interdependent. Now, in this modern day, we have a growing, uh, uh, what do you call it? What's the word? When you can't see, so you think it's something, it's like a mirage. Thank you. An illusion, a growing illusion. I so knew somebody was going to do that for me. Thank you for being the place where I know I'm okay to not find my words. Thank you. That there is an illusion. It's written. <laughs> I, I love myself. Pumpkin. All right. So we live in an illusion, and it's an expanding illusion that we are separate because the way that we are interconnected and interdependent with one another is invisible. We don't have to go to the store and interact with someone if we don't feel like it, if it's uncomfortable, if it's cold outside, if whatever the annoyance, like going to the store and everything was locked up and no one was there to help me get it. Like there's another reason for me not to go out into the world and to interact so that I am living in the demonstration of my interdependence and interconnectedness, right? There's so many ways. I went to maybe two stores for Christmas shopping. I am done. <laughs> I'm very proud of myself, but probably because I did it online. I didn't, inter I didn't experience, I didn't even see the person that rang my doorbell and left a package. For all I know, it just boop, magically appeared because by the time I went out the door, they were gone. And it's easy to fall into that illusion because it's comfortable. It's really comfortable not to have to interact with other people, especially if you're an introvert. Extroverts, it's more painful. And so because we have it so convenient, our lives are so convenient. I heard someone say in a TikTok video this week that there was the scam of convenience that was leaving us sicker and lonelier. 
Let me tell you, I have been looking at every single convenient, well, the ones when I can think of it, the conveniences that I engage in, and I'm tying it back to my experience of not being connected and not feeling connected to you wonderful people because it's just eh, easier. Yeah, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> Most of you, well, no, you would remember when they did that. How do we see others as whole? How do we do that? In a world where we are having an illusion of feeling like we are actually no longer independent, interdependent, interconnected, further and further away from the truth, the reality that we are unbroken wholeness. How do we do that? It takes effort. It takes work. You have to know that you are seeking something and turn your attention to that something and move in a direction. Because the world just has, sit back, it's okay. Watch another TikTok video. It's fine. Go to Netflix, your queue is full. Right, Belinda was sharing with me, she works in advertising, she's like, you know, the most searched term is what to do, in, things to do in Albuquerque. It's like, you're not even searching for a thing, because that's the thing that you want, just something. <laughs> just something to do, to generate some kind of, I don't distraction. What are we seeking? What are we looking for? Where are we trying to get? So it's work, but it's worthy and essential work. And those of us who come to these rooms are not afraid of hard work, or you, this would be your first and last time. Because science of mind is challenging, right? But we can do things that are, are some that sometimes look like insincere, insincere claims, like, you know, thoughts and prayers are with you when we see things. And people complain about it, and there's the two sides, and, well, what do you mean my thoughts and prayers are power, they're powerful? Yes, true. But where is that coming from in you? Are you holding that person, that situation as self? Don't stop, you know, sending your thoughts and prayers. But just look more deeply into where, where is that coming from? Are you genuinely holding them as a part of this beautiful interconnected web that we are blessed to be a part of. Do the work of stretching, the deep work of healing the illusion that's very convenient. That I don't even know, I push some buttons and keys and I get my stuff right at my door. Ernest Holmes says in 365 Days of Richer Living, since there is but one spirit, and this spirit is in you and in everything, then everywhere you go, you will meet this spirit. You meet this spirit in people, in places, and in things. You're not just meeting other people, annoying people, people that make you uncomfortable. You are meeting the divine in every single person that you meet, in every single thing that you engage with. You are meeting the divine. Oh, what was that movie we just watched? The one about heaven and, uh, oh man, dance in heaven and if I see you face to face. Anyway, it was a great movie, but it was talking about what, would I, what will I do when I'm in heaven? When I see you, we don't have that idea of heaven. Heaven's right here, and you are the divine. What would I do? What will I do when I am face to face with you, divine spirit? Each of you. It starts within. It is recognizing self first as wellness. That's the first step of, a, well, I guess the second step. The first step is there's wholeness. Yay! It's unbroken. Woohoo! Second step, I am part of that. I am part of that. That work starts within. To see the good in all, in everything, we begin recognizing the spark of divinity at the center of our own being first. But we don't stop there, right? It's knowing ourselves as whole and complete and knowing ourselves as expressions of that one life, God's life, and then we allow that knowing 
to underscore everything that we do and every interaction that we have. And that takes a lot of attention. This is me on TikTok. In case, in case it's not familiar to you, this is me like, oh, I'm God in form and so are you, the person that I was just cussing out in my head because I don't agree with what you're saying. It starts within. We are actively, or the, the, the hope is that we are actively courting the divine in one another. What was it like at whatever point in your life that you courted someone, that you were like, oh, God, they're so cute, and I can't wait to see them again, and they're so interesting. How did you show up? Alive, engaged, focused. It takes focused attention for us when we are courting the divine in one another. And when we do that, here's what happens. We become elevated and we have a holy vantage point for the whole experience. We begin to see, you know, when you're down at the regular level, and you're like, oh, this is happening. Just these things are happening in the whole world. But if you get in a plane, and you see from whatever thousand feet, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you see a bigger picture, yes? You see a bigger picture. Or when you get up higher, maybe you're not, you haven't flown in a plane. You get up higher, you see more. You have a better understanding of, of the landscape. And so when we do the work of that holy, active courting of the divine in ourselves, we are elevated, and now we can see the landscape more clearly, and we can see that the divine is actually moving and breathing and having its way in all of creation. We elevate our consciousness in order to see those that were formally identified in our minds as others, those other people. When I was a kid, my dad used to laugh so much because I came up this, with this thing called PLTs and PLUs because we would talk about the people like them and the people like us. Right? How do we transform the idea of those people that we formally identify as other, different, separate, enemy, threat, stranger across the street? And instead, we can see them as our brothers and our sisters, our brothers and our sisters, extensions of ourselves. And when we do that work, we step into a realm where these aren't people out there, things that are happening out there. They become soul companions. Can you imagine walking into the natural grocers? There's a soul companion, and there's a soul companion, and you're a soul companion, and you're a soul companion. You tune in with one another along the journey in a different way not something that I have to turn my eyes from because it's too hard to see. But if you are my sole companion, gentleman across the street, outside of this whatever building that doesn't look like it's very nice, in the early morning having a seizure, as my sole companion, I get out of that car and I go over there and I at the very least hold your hand. If you are my sole companion, I walk this journey with you so differently. And that grows me. That expands me. That makes me so much more. And I can now see this unbroken connection, this unbroken wholeness that we are. Where we had thought to find an abomination, we find God. Where we had thought to slay another, we slay ourselves. Where we had thought to travel outwards, we shall come to the center of our own existence. Where we had thought to be alone, 
we shall be with all the world. That is a quote from Falling Off Word by Richard Rohr. He's quoting Joseph Campbell. A declaration that's been attributed to a few people, but this I'll just say to Gandhi, be the change you wish to see in the world. You, you, what is it? Uh, uh, but what can I do, said seven billion, how many people are there on the planet? Seven billion. seven billion. But what can I do, said seven billion people. Just me by myself. We all said it. We all say it. Be the change you wish to see in the world. We can recognize the wholeness in others by reaching in and then reaching out. And when we do that, we feel the harmony that comes out of that engagement when we reach out into the world. You, can't, you can imagine it, but it's not the same. Reach out. You need to do it. Engage yourself. Engage your mind. Engage your heart. Engage your body. And feel that harmony that comes from acting with love. Not just to the people that are closest to you. Of course, that's wonderful and beautiful. And, and we want to do that. Reach out in love and kindness and in friendship to the people that are your brothers and sisters that you have never met before. Those that have felt un that you felt unsure with, maybe felt really uncomfortable around. Cultivating beautiful relationships, especially with those that we least expect, is a surefire way to see goodness, the goodness that exists in humanity. Our attention right now is being pulled in every other direction than seeing the absolute brilliant goodness in humanity. We have it. It starts right here. Let somebody see you. Let somebody see you be that goodness in humanity. So, it's good to remember that when the divine thought us into being, it didn't discriminate. It poured its complete, rich, juicy, yummy goodness into every single one of us, just the same. It created every person on this planet from the same pattern of perfection and instilled in us energy and beauty and love and its own authentic heart. Within each of you beats the heart of God. The rich, the poor, the sick, the healthy, the sober, the intoxicated, the conservative, the liberal, all of us have that same heart beating. Witnessing the good in another is not a deviation from the norm. It is the reason we're given each other. It is why we are given each other to walk this beautiful journey of life. To see the love of God. This week, I invite you to consciously, mindfully bless others. Just bless them in your heart. Bless them in your mind. Take a walk for the purpose of blessing people. That's all. Start very little. Everyone you encounter every single one of them, and bless them. As you do this, you become energized. Because when you do that, you're allowing God